Howdy. Good evening. I think this is, this is time to begin now. Uh, you're going to be sick of seeing me. I'm so sorry to be the guy again. But um, I, I wanted Snyder to do it, but he told me, no, I had to do it. So here I am. Um, do we have, can we start with announcements right now? I don't think there are mics set up. Oh, there's a mic set up here. If you need, if you need mics for announcements, grab them right there. But if you don't, stand up and speak very loudly. Anybody? Go. Bestofneworleans.com? Yep. You could build a theremin, you know. Pretty easy to build. Uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> you'd do something better with the money, that's all. Hi, Kyle. Hi. Um, See, everybody. Cool. Welcome. Simon. How do we get in touch with you, Corey? That's easy. All right. NOLA Sound, through NOLA Sound maybe? That's easy, right? Corey's with, uh, Corey's with NOLA Sound, so if you want to get hooked up with Corey, do that. Who else? Anybody? Yes. Okay. All right. Any more Craig's listings? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Our guest tonight is a gentleman named Dick Huey. He is. Uh, uh, he is the owner of a company called Toolshed. He has been uh, a music business professional for one, in one way or another uh, for the last 20 years. He started out playing music in bars and uh, began managing artists that he encountered uh, while a musician himself. He um, became uh, a marketer for Beggar's Banquet, uh, the venerable indie label and became, uh, ultimately became their new media person. Dick was the first new media person I ever, I ever heard of. I didn't realize there was such a thing as new media. Uh, he had to tell me what new media meant. Billy was the first manager I ever heard of who actually did new media. Well. Employed it. Yeah, so we, uh, I was using new media, but I didn't know it. Uh, Dick told me I was. 
Um, and uh, since then, he, he left, uh, uh, since leaving Beggars as, as their dedicated guy, he started this company, Toolshed, uh, which does digital um, music promotion, internet marketing. So when you see a feature at iTunes or a feature on Stereo Gum or Pitchfork or Fader, Dick is likely the guy who, who, uh, who got that for the artist that he, that he was working with. He's worked with every indie label that you care to list, uh, and he has been cultivating a stellar reputation in the music industry for years and years. He is one of music's true nice guys, and how he succeeds is beyond me. But this is Dick. He's going to talk to you a little bit, and, and when it, first of all, you know, feel free just to throw up a hand during any, any aspect of what he's saying. Y if something occurs to you, you want to ask a question, just ask a question. I'll look for your hand, and, um, and I'll try to kind of moderate. And as Dick is speaking, if, if, if anything occurs to me that I think might be worth sharing with you, I'll pause and, 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 uh, and jump in to talk to him. But um, without further ado, Dick Huey. Thank you. Thanks, Billy. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So, um, I guess where I'm going to start with this um, is I'm going to try to start right where you were, or right where you are right now. Um, I didn't start in the in the music business intending to go into the music business. I started uh, intending to play music and. It was a real conscious shift to move from being somebody who played music to thinking it was actually okay to be in the music business because uh, when I started doing this, which was back in the late 80s, um, there was uh, a real sort of negative vibe around the music business part of it. You know, I thought of, of big guys sitting in offices somewhere smoking cigars and, you know, uh, doing nasty things to artists. I guess that still hasn't changed very much. Um, but uh, I was really worried about uh, going from the musician phase into the business phase. So I started out playing music in bars in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I didn't have any connections or contacts within the music business, which probably fits a lot of you. Uh, and I really didn't know where to start. I, when I started, I did pretty much everything wrong. I was um, not really trying to play too much out of the Charlotte market, so it wasn't too hard lining up shows at the time. But I did start, um, I was out at a bar and um, playing with my band, and the woman that came on after me, I thought was great. And so uh, I started going to her shows and decided somehow about three months down the, down the road after shadowing her and, and then her being convinced that I was a stalker, to corner her and say, you know, I think you're really talented. I think I would like to help you. And she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, I don't really know what it means, but I, I feel strongly enough about your music that I would like to help you. And that was really the first conscious step I took out of the performing side of things and into the business side of things, and something anybody can do. I get asked all the time by bands, you know, or, uh, well, not so much by bands, I guess, but by, by managers, you know, how, how do I start? How do I get into management? And really, that's the way to do it. Um, go out and find somebody that you believe in. So I believed in, Cher in Shirley Dillon was her name. And we started sending her music around. We sent it to every record label we could think of, which was probably the wrong way to do it. We wasted a lot of money on stamps and um, postage. Uh, but we did get lucky. We got um, a German record label, Glitterhouse, to uh, pick us up and signed up the band. I had a very fun couple of years where I got to follow this band over to Europe and act as the tour manager and drive a van. Um, again, as I'm sure many of you do, um, I did. We drove all over Europe for about seven weeks. It was, um, and you too, of course. Yeah. Uh, for about seven weeks, uh, hitting a different city every night. And so I started to learn a little bit more about the music business, and I picked up another band. Um, this was a band named June. They were based in Chapel Hill in the early 90s. And um, the way I was able to pick up that band was, was you know, by virtue of the fact that I had, had already signed an artist. So I, you know, I found somebody good 
And I really focus on somebody I like because I made a conscious decision that if I was going to have to have this person giving me calls at 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning and, and have to listen to their music over and over again, it better be somebody that, that I liked, not somebody that I just thought I could make money off of. So it's interesting, Dick, that you, you, know, you came to this based solely on conviction and meaningfulness. You, you, you made your decision to get involved with something that you weren't comfortable or aware of necessarily <coughs> simply because you, you believed in that music. You, you just wanted to lend a hand. You just wanted to be a helper. And you didn't worry that you didn't know how. You didn't worry that you were going to have to be completely self-taught. No. You just did it because you were sort of impelled to do so. That's exactly right. And, and I did... Um, I didn't really have, a, have a, a template to go off of or a model or, or even a manager who I knew to ask how to do this. So I just went out to the bookstore and I found uh, the Musician's Guide to Touring and Promotion and I found the Donald Passman book, um, ah. which many of you have read. I read it too <laughs> in 1989. I should probably reread it at this point. But um, So I read a few of those books and um, uh, the, the Europe stuff sort of took care of itself at a lucky break, but it happens to a lot of people. Um, in the States, though, nobody knew who my artist was, so it was a lot of legwork. And, um, you know, it was looking through the Musician's Guide to Touring and Promotion and figuring out where I was going to make phone calls, sending tapes. It's so different now. It's just so completely different. And, and it's only 20 years later from when I started doing it. In fact, um, from the sort of the onset of the digital age, as far as as far as I'm concerned, which really was around 1998 or so, um, it's been just a little over 10 years. And the exciting part about that, I think for all of you who are getting ready to start your own business, whether it's um, a band business or whether it's a manager business or going to work for a record label, is that in 10 years there's no way you can figure out all the great things that you can do in a particular industry. It's different if, you know, the industry's been around for, for 200 years, but digital music has only been around for 10 years. There are plenty, tons of ideas that have yet to be developed, and maybe you will develop some of them. And, uh, you know, you can have a lot of fun doing it. You can make a lot of money doing it if you do it right. So I'll try to give you some tips and pointers in that respect. Cool. Um, you, um, you, you basically uh, have made a... I mean, as you transitioned out of management and into promotion, I mean, you, you essentially created a space for yourself. You, you know, you saw uh, a need, uh, and, and you filled it. And, and the need you saw was, I, I suppose, and I'm going to characterize this, and you can, you can do so otherwise, but you saw um, the Internet and digital outlets as more important than most people thought they were at the time. And you started paying attention to those outlets, very early on, and giving giving those those outlets credibility and, and, and more fully their due. Um, can you speak a little bit about about kind of how you built Toolshed and, and, and what your mm -hmm. process is there in terms of the you know, the actual act of, of marketing and promotion? I will. Um, but before I do that, I just want to go to one sure. thing that you said there, which is. Um, a lot of what happens, I think, in life is, is accidental, and it's about being in the right place at the right time. Um, but you can influence that. And um, a great place to look, the, the thing that took me to new media and that eventually resulted in, in my company, Toolshed, was um, uh, you know, I used the management piece to um, leapfrog into a label job at, at Beggar's Banquet in New York, which was right when they had opened up their office. And um, Beggars was in the process of expanding at that time. They were um, uh, bringing under their fold or into their fold labels like 4AD, which was responsible for the Pixies and the Breeders and um, Throwing Muses. Throwing Muses, that <laughs> great and venerable band, the Throwing Muses. Um, and, uh, uh, and several others. XL Recording, which you might know, they put out um, the Prodigy Records. Um, Matador? Yeah, Matador. Pavement, Cat Power. I mean, just a ton of great labels in one place, right? So, um, anyway, we, I, 
was about a year and a half into running marketing there, and we all heard about new media, and nobody really knew very much about it, so we started a little working group. And that working group grew, and eight months later, the chairman, Martin Mills, asked if there was somebody in the group that wanted to volunteer to step out of their position and step into new media. And when I heard it, I just assumed that everybody there was going to jump. And nobody jumped. And we had <laughs> label heads. We had um, friends of mine. Um, we're still in the music business, so I won't name them all. But uh, nobody said anything. So I said, well, I'll do it. I'll try it. And that was the start of everything. And, and four years later, I decided to take this company, Toolshed, um, and base it on what I had been doing at Beggars. So in 2001, this company started in 2001, there was no money in digital music. There was no iTunes yet. Right. Um, there really, really was no reason why, if you had a small independent record label, you would spend money on a person doing what I did. And, and that's where you look for opportunity when you're looking for jobs or for ideas for business. Uh, or businesses is where is there no money now, but you think there might be some money in the future. Um, so that that's where I, I set up Toolshed, and I left out one thing too. One of the ways that um, I was able to set up Toolshed because I was confident that at that point that I knew enough people um, in the in the industry that I could um, effectively promote bands, which is what we do. Um, I, I got that. And by that you mean by that you mean you had you had strong relationships not only with band representatives and the la and labels, but also with the outlets themselves. You knew you knew the dudes at Pitchfork, and you knew this, you know you know the Stereo Gum people, and you you had relationships with uh, the folks at iTunes. I remember QuickTime. Exactly. You just had you just had people that you could connect. You you could you could take. Um, something you were working on behalf of an artist and and draw a connection you know introduce one person to the other person and and, and facilitate opportunity that's exactly right um, and and one of the things that gave me that that um, confidence in that that group of, of people to work with um, was something that I stumbled on by accident and uh, you know if there's one sort of mantra that I, I carry around with me all the time uh, you should all think of this. Um, it, you have to give to get. As far as I'm concerned, that is the golden rule of, it's the golden rule of my business, golden rule of a lot of very successful businesses. Um, in my case, what that meant was, um, and this is something anybody can do, uh, I, I have been through a variety of different organizations that I actually set up. Um, I used to ski, um, so I, um, I uh, was really involved with the ski team when I was in college. After I got out of college and got started getting into music, I said, well, I'm going to put together a group of people that like to talk about music. And we got together at the bar and um, would talk. And then we sort of were thinking about what was bad about music in our home city. And well, there was no independent radio. So we started a group called the Alternative Radio Coalition. And through putting on shows, um, you know, et cetera, we grew to about 1,200 people. I found out the other day that, that group is still around. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no <laughs> idea. But I got written by a DJ, and they're still using our, our name. And um, and then and then we did an, I did another one like that when I started Toolshed. I decided, well, you know what? I'm going to get together with two other new media people I know. One of them was uh, my friend Christina from uh, who works now at Ryko, and another one was Frank Davis who works at AskaWorks. And we call ourselves the Mutual Admiration Society. We talked about all the great things that we were doing. Right. And, and, and so there were three of us, and then there were four, and then there were five, 10. And um, you know, I would invite other new media people from around. <laughs> and I kind of made it a point to be the, like, the point guy and the guy who would answer questions from mm -hmm. people because I had good experience from beggars. So you're sort of a serial organizer. A serial organizer, you yeah, like but it's <laughs> easy. Anybody can do this. Well, yeah, of course. It, it, it's, it's anybody can do it, but not anybody would do it. And so, and so one of the things that I think uh, is instructive and, and valuable for, for, for folks to, to, to know about you is that you, know, you took a certain amount of initiative. It takes a certain amount of initiative, but it, it takes a certain personality type. To, you are, you are a, a connector above, and, ab above all That's else. That's exactly right. I mean, you're not, you, you know, um, many of you will know the, uh, 
uh, the, the Malcolm, uh, the Malcolm Gladwell uh, types, you know, connectors, mavens, uh, authority. Dick's a connector. This guy is a connector. He doesn't try to tell anybody what to do. He just likes to put people together and. And I don't charge for it. It's, it's a, that's that's not <laughs> yeah. something that you that you you say. That's well, free. I know this guy, and I had lots of people come to me and say, "I'll uh, I'll help you get a record deal for your band, and um, you know, but if you get it, I want ten thousand um, dollars." Assuming that there was going to be ten thousand dollars, and that's not that's not what I'm talking about. I'm really talking about giving to get. So yeah. I gave my time and my energy, and sometimes it was a lot of time and energy, and it meant staying up late. But by doing that, I met all these indie record people uh, because it was it gave me an excuse to call them. Like I wanted to call, um, I think it was Epitaph at one point, and if you try to call Epitaph and they don't know who you are, then you're either probably going to go in the general mailbox or into somebody's voicemail, and that's where you'll stay. But if you call them and say, uh, "Hi, I'm calling with," um, we called it the Indemen Independent New Media Professional Association, with INMPA, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd like to talk to so and so in new media because um, we have an organization of independent new media people, and I think it, it's something you might enjoy. It's a networking group. And, and, and something that people can benefit from. All of a sudden, you get a from. call back. Right. Because they can benefit from it. You gave them something. So really important lesson. And it, and it worked great for my business. So, so now to get into the business itself, we started this thing out with, um, with one label. When I left Beggars, I kept them as a client. So I started working on Beggars releases. Um, the next label that, that we got hooked up with was um, Kill Rock Stars. That was our first project. And I found a friend of mine that knew someone at Kill Rock Stars, asked them if they'd put me in touch. They did. And uh, it was the Sleater Skinny record, um, uh, the one that came out in 2001. Dig Me Dig, dig me Out? Dig Me Up. Dig Me Out. Dig Me Out. Um, that was our first record. And at that time, there were about 15 promotional outlets, maybe. A promotional outlet, you know, that's, that's a, a place to put up music. Maybe at uh, Microsoft, uh, at the MSN Music page. Or it might have been at uh, Artist Direct. Uh, there were no blogs back then. Yeah, so you want to know? I mean, you know, you, you cruise around the internet, and you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But but people do, and and you you find you want to find out where this music comes from, how it happens. I mean, there are filters on these on these sites, just like anything else. You know, uh, and and y very very often, you know, you need some sort of intermediary. Uh, you know, although now anybody can write an email and pitch their band, and that's and that's exceedingly valuable. Um, there are times when it really helps when you want some kind of feature coverage. You want somebody to make a little bit of a fuss to give you a little more space, uh, a little more a little more attention. Uh, a person like Dick, with with the benefit of all his relationships and 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 his um, and his finesse in the in, in the in the in the, in, the, in the marketing process can be of, of, of great value. And, and utilizing finesse is a, a, a great segue into the next part of this, which is um, it's, it's really important, um, going again back to the whole give and get um, thing I was talking about a minute ago, um, that you take the time to know who you're writing to. You know, if, if you are going to write to me, or if uh, one of you has a blog, and I'm going to write to you. I'm going to I'm going to spend some time on your blog first. I'm going to read some of it, um, and and then I'm going to ask you a question. You know, I can see that you're into X Y Z. Would you be into, you know, A B C? Mm -hmm. And if you if you don't take that first step, you you lose 99% of the effectiveness of your message. So Absolutely. we kind of built this whole company on effective messaging, and that's effective messaging, and it applies all the way across the board. It's a really, really important principle that, that I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know if people really appreciate the gravity of that. You know, it's, it's not enough to just write a note and say, my band is awesome, you got to cover it, we, we, you know, we fit right in, or, what, you know, you should really take the time to know that there's a person on the other end, and their time is valuable. And, and really, you're intruding on their, you're interrupting their day in some way. And you gotta show them that there's some, that you, some merit to that interruption. That they're basically 
you're costing them something. You're costing them attention of some sort. <clears throat> you're costing them their attention. They only have so much attention they can pay. And you, you cost them that attention. You gotta re reward them for that in some way. Show them that there's a reason that they should pay attention. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, we, I, I, I feel like I get a lot of email a day. I mean, I get, I get usually a couple hundred emails a day. Um, and that's really hard to deal with that load. I don't even get as much as a lot of other people in the music industry. There's a guy named Bruno who runs um, the iTunes store. And Bruno, I I'm sure, gets eight or 900 emails in a day. And if all he sees in an email is, my band is great, that means nothing to him. And it's also, you're not also not giving him anything. Um, I I've, I've had a bunch of conversations this fall with bloggers and with other um, uh, outlets for music, because this fall has been a particularly busy time. We've gone from, uh, several years ago, about 37,000 releases in a year, to this fall, over 115,000 releases. In a year. Wow. In a year. And if you, go to, um, if you go to Pitchfork and look at the list of records that was released in the last three weeks, October 6th, the 13th, and the 20th, records always come out on Tuesday, um, there are close to 200 named bands, bands that you would know. And think about that. I mean, as a blogger, how many bands can you write about in one day? Um, and, and are they all gonna, I mean, are they, are they all gonna be from the same place? Are you gonna try, try to cover different genres? And you can see how quickly it becomes really difficult to deal with the amount of information, the amount of bands that are out there. So you have to do something to make your project special. Um, let's see, where do I wanna go from there? Um, let, me, let me get back to where I was. So, <coughs> so Toolshed started out providing the same service I had provided at Beggars Group, which was digital promotion, um, but also digital licensing. Uh, this was an area that really nobody wanted to deal with too much. You know, it was kind of a, a legal area. I don't have any training as, a, as an attorney, but I used to have to read all the contracts at Beggars. So I, I said, well, you know what? If you kill rock stars, if you sign me up, I'll not only uh, handle your, your digital promotion, but I'll handle your digital licensing. I'll help you do your deal when you want to sell the music from your label to iTunes. Right. And they I didn't can't, have I can't tell you how many people have used this man to figure out how to get their stuff on iTunes without, you know, um, th and this is where TuneCore comes in as well, you know. You know. Right. I should Dick, start. Dick is an advisor to TuneCore who all of you should know, I hope you all know TuneCore. Um, uh, you know, Dick is, um, is, is an advisor to TuneCore as well as being on the board of SoundExchange. He, he has the Matador seat um, uh, at, at SoundExchange. So um, uh, again, that's your sort of something about your life as a connector. But you were talking about this, this stuff that, 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 um, that Dick has done as a, as a, as a music pro over you know over the years that he's done this stuff, but it's important to know that what he does and what he's learned over the course of any hundreds and hundreds of bands is all the same stuff that you have to know, and that you'll be doing for yourselves or for your clients or for your label or whatever. You're going to need to deduce the same bits of information that he did over the course of hundreds of bands. And you're, you're not gonna have a lot of time to do that. You're gonna have to do it pretty quickly. And you're gonna have to understand that you don't have a lot of time to fail. So when, when Dick is talking about the things that he's done and learned with Toolshed, uh, it would be great, it, it would really behoove you to think about these principles with regard to how you will address yourselves and, and your own careers and uh, you know, your, your journey through the business you know, as an artist advocate or or whatever. And here's another another point that relates to that. It's probably a good time to bring this up. So I, I had a new client. Um, how did I pick that client? I picked that client because I decided really early in the process that I wanted to have a brand that stood for something. And the reason I wanted to have a brand that stood for something is because I worked for a label that had a brand, or several brands actually, that really stand for something. I, you know, certainly among people who love Matador Records, everybody knows what Matador 
splits out. I mean, it's a very recognized, very well-known brand. It has a very distinct voice. The label owners are directly involved in uh, Gerard Cosloy and, and uh, Patrick Amory and Chris Lombardi are all directly involved in how that label puts itself out there. So I thought, I, I want to do the same thing. I want to I want to make Tool Shed stand for the same great music that those labels are into. Uh -huh. And that came brought me up, to, I guess, to my second um, cardinal rule, which is be careful not to try to be all things to all people. When you start your business, figure out what people are going to know you for and what they're going to associate you with. When I was starting Toolshed, and I, I can show you, um, give you an idea of, you know, now that we're nine years into the um, into the thing, um, so my app's still online. You can see that we've amassed hundreds and hundreds. We have like 350 projects going back to 07, 06, and there are labels like Merge, Touch and Go. Stop, stop on one of those and maybe click sure. on a page. Because what, what Dick would do is, is at Toolshed, he would put up a project, and what a project is in this case would be a page of what he would call digital assets. How about Arcade Fire? Yeah, so, so Arcade Fire, whoops, oh. <laughs> bad one, sorry. <laughs> I have a feeling that, okay, I think we got a little. You went too old. You went I think too I might old. have gone too old. I think I know what the problem is. <laughs> this is another thing you should know. Before you ever do a presentation, you should always make sure that you know what you're <laughs> Check your in. links. Let me pick one that's a little newer. Yeah. I don't know if you well, guys. Well, there's a Deerhoof one. Yeah. yeah, how about Deerhoof? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Work, please. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good enough. So here's a. So sorry, that's an asset. Here. So, so that's an asset page. So uh, they're digital. Digital assets, online asset, assets, and, and you know, by that, when we say asset, we mean the Deerhoof website, you know, online music, videos. If you want to hear music? You can play it right from. Okay. Okay. So that was this particular song was the promotional MP3 for this campaign. And then you know, there's embedded video and shareable widgets and all kinds of stuff. So. So Dick's company would compile all this stuff onto a, onto a, onto a, a, a page, a, like a, a rich media page. And he could then refer outlets to this link, or he could, he, could, he could send somebody a link to something that's on this page, so that when you would obtain a feature, say, at Stereogum, mm -hmm. you, you would, you know, the person you were corresponding with, you would just send them a link, and they'd go get whatever they wanted. That's right. And there's an interesting part of that, which is that if um, again, again, pretty early in the game, I thought, I want people to come to, my, how am I going to get people to come to my site? And I thought, well, I can't just have a website. Uh, I want to have a, a place, I want to have a list of music. And that's where this came from. You know, I, I, I said, I'm going to start, I'm going to create a, a little program. I'll find a programmer, and I spent about uh, $4,000. And I had him write the first version of this software program, which just started listing things. And I thought, I'm going to make this URL, this, this, uh, URL for my project, the place that people are going to think of when they want to come get music. And as we added great record labels, Luakabop, uh, Touch and Go, Saddle Creek, um, all these places, um, and, and uh, we wound up with a tremendous cross-section of great music that was very highly branded. Um, that music stood for something. So people came to associate my company with, with a filter. We became a filter for music because we picked great music to work with. And Very important. we picked great music to work with because nobody else was really sure there was any money in, in, in this business. Um, you know, and they didn't want to go What do you there. mean by that? What well, do you mean when you say people weren't sure there was money in this business? They weren't sure that, well, at the time, like I said, there was no iTunes. So, so um, there, really w I there really was no budget. I should, I should explain that. There really was no budget to hire somebody like me. So that's when I came up with the idea, well, maybe if I do more than just promotion, if I also do licensing for them, since that does involve money, maybe they'll hire me. Right. And that's exactly what happened. That's how I got my first five clients, which, which were Righteous Babe, which is Ani DeFranco's label, um, Spin Art, Kill Rock Stars, Merge, Touch and Go, and Saddle Creek. Right. So those were my six first clients. Well, and you did that by extending yourself. You did, yep. you, did what, you did more than you had to do or more than you were supposed to do. And you extended yourself, and you 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 know you did you did extra because you were, as a resource constrained business, it, there wasn't a lot you had to lose. You you just had to invest a little extra time and effort, but you were willing to do something that they didn't know how to do for themselves. That's that's right, and I was also willing to do it cheaper. And 
most promotion companies um, at that time were charging somewhere in the range of uh, anywhere from $3,000 to maybe $4,500 a month. That's how you priced your campaigns. So I thought, I'm gonna price myself quite a bit south of that because I'm not, I don't wanna go after um, the Beastie Boys, although we did end up going after and getting the Beastie Boys campaign last year. But at that time I said, I'm not gonna go after the Beastie Boys, I'm gonna go after the small bands, the little labels, the ones that have little budgets, mm -hmm. and, and artists. I mean, I started working with you and yep. with Kristen um, back, back when there just was not a lot of money to go around, and that, that's how we did it, so. Um, then iTunes came along, and iTunes <coughs> kind of opened the floodgates. Now all of a sudden, bands were, um, were doing upwards of, uh, in this year, upwards of 50% or 60% of their business in digital. Mm -hmm. So that really changed the game for the labels, because now all of a sudden, you know, where before they had said, well, we can't really afford to bring anybody on, well now 60% of their income was, was made from digital music, and they really kind of had to afford to bring somebody on. Yeah, I just spoke to a pretty well-known artist who's, who's seeing 70% digital right now. Yeah, it's remarkable. So it's amazing. We talked about this today in-, in And Amazon, too. And Amazon. 35% uh, of their, their total book sales are now Kindle. Digital, yeah, digital. yeah. So, we, we mentioned this in, in uh, intro today at one point, but this, you know the, the, the changes in the music industry really shouldn't be dismaying to you. They, they, they should be. They're all opportunities. These are opportunities and you should understand. And that's not, that's not a, a high, a high uh, concept thing to say. The fact is that the, the market has only moved. There's still this tremendous amount of enthusiasm for music. There's still, you know, people stopped buying CDs and they're stopping buying CDs. But that doesn't mean that there isn't this incredible libido for music, this urge to have and to interact with and to, and to love music and to uh, want to support musicians. It's, it's there. We're in the process of defining new ways to engage with that market. That's right. And, and, and to talk for a second about um, some of the, so as, as I was going along with all this stuff, um, people would start to come to me. And this all came through the networking really I can't recommend it highly enough. In fact, if you want to see an, another example of somebody who's doing exactly the same thing I did, go to digitalnashville.com. There's another woman named Ellen Eichler, very sharp, and she started the same kind of group in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And she's now got over a thousand members. Amazing. And she's doing the same thing. It's like, a, it's like a, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's like a textbook thing to do. You want to, you, you know, you want to begin networking. Well, found a group. I bet there's not one in New Orleans. I mean, yeah. You know, it's. it's um, yeah. I mean, know know what you, what you are, what you stand for, and and, and see if you can't yeah. find like-minded people. It's not only an audience or listeners that you're looking for. It's also peers. You always want to look for peers as well. So if there are other people just doing the stuff you're doing, you know, we have a, a legal EU. These these dudes are sitting front and center here today, right? So they're they these, this is a for-profit uh, company that provides legal services like filing, copyright, and. Uh, and, and, and you know, BMI ASCAP affiliations and things like that for students for a small fee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, you know, people who, who are interested in, in entertainment legal, you know, entertainment law, I mean, there's how many people around? That, that, that could be a group that grows enormous. You know, Absolutely, um, no and, question and, and about rapidly, it. nationally or locally or regionally. And um, no matter what you're really into doing, promoting gigs, uh, you know, touring, you know, you can, you can, there are ways of affiliating with other like-minded people and, and supporting one another. The music industry hasn't been known as a very cooperative industry um, over, its, over its time, but I think that you've broken that rule and it's served you incredibly well. And I think that you've taught people by, by example that cooperation doesn't mean that you're a sucker. Cooperation doesn't mean so that you lose a trade secret or lose a competitive advantage. Cooperation, being somewhat altruistic, has a place in the music industry. It does, and there, there, I mean, there's an awful lot of climbing that goes on at, at especially at, at bigger companies, not just record labels, but bigger management companies, whoever it is, and that's never gonna go away. But if, that, if that's not who you are, there's no saying that you can't be successful too, right. because that's not who I am, I didn't, sorry. I didn't want to do that. 
But even if, if even if it's guy. just you know, even if it's just finding other people with a similar sense of humor to your own, sure. you know, like when you go to <clears throat> when you go to South by Southwest or CMJ, you know, you socialize, you click with somebody, and you're like, there, I have an industry friend now. I have another industry friend over here, somebody that I get it. You just move outside your circle and 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 really try to connect with people. This is a this is an industry of connections, and and I don't mean that in a cynical way. I mean that in a really nice way. This is you know. People connect fairly deeply in this business, and um, and the the facility for connection now is you know thanks to technology, especially social media, is so much uh, more facile. It makes it so much easier and and more ready for you to be able to keep in touch and and to generate two way communications with the people who you think are like minded. Sympathize with that, you. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, not, not, of course, none of those tools existed even five years ago. This is what I mean when you're talking about a, a market that's moving away from CDs. Yeah. Well, they're going somewhere, and the way, uh, the ability to stay in touch now, is is incredibly enhanced. I mean, uh, you don't. Do would you agree? And we have to. I have to give the example from from the other night. Do you care if I do? Oh. Your, your example. So so so, uh, Billy has his, has his own Twitter, and uh, he came up uh, with Kristen and did a, a show. At, at my sister's house, which was wonderful, um, uh, you know, like a, uh, they call it Shady Circle, and they didn't have a show in Atlanta, and um, yeah. he posted that right, on, right. or Kristen posted about that <laughs> right. on her Twitter, and um, the next thing he knew, um, not only had had uh, the word spread around about that, but um, a real big blogger, uh, Aquarium Drunkard, a guy named Justin Gage, had um, written about it, and. They wound up with a show. Yeah. And well, it was funny. We had it. We had this. We had a couple of private Remarkable. shows. It's exactly the way it's A couple worked. of private shows this weekend, and uh, this is not about me, so I'll, we'll move fast. But we had a couple of private shows, and we were just driving out to do them, and our Atlanta one went off, and uh, and so Kristen tweeted to her fairly small network of 5,000 followers, uh, you know, uh, that we're not. We're too bad we're not stopping in Atlanta, and people were like, well, why not? Come on, stop, stop in Atlanta, and she said, well. I'll tell you what, I got a show tonight in Chapel Hill, but if somebody wants to do a show, I'll come back to Atlanta tomorrow uh, on my way back to New Orleans. And um, we were inundated with requests for shows. And we found somebody who seemed like they knew what they were doing and we trusted them. And um, we said, all right, dude, you put on the show. It'll be great. Invite as many people as you want. And um, he put on this huge house show last night and Aquarium Drunkard you know, wrote about the show and Criminal Records and Ames, Ames Network wrote about it, and it was, it was great. We, instead of just driving through Atlanta, we stopped for three hours. We met, we, we met, made sixty fans. Met, met sixty Probably. new people, <laughs> and and had a ball. And, and I drove until four thirty in the morning, getting home to New Orleans. But uh, <laughs> so I'm a little crispy. So now you know today. why he's tired. Yeah, but um, but it was totally worth it. And and it, that couldn't have happened without Twitter. And I know you guys are kind of dubious as to the value of Twitter, but. When what you know when when it comes right down to it and when it matters you, when you need to reach out to people, that's when that's when the power of a network is is a pretty beautiful thing. Yeah, I spent I spent I don't know how many years, just sort of letting my Facebook slowly grow, and I was lucky that mine did continue to grow because it because everybody knew me because I was had done all this given and giving to get stuff, and um, then at some point I realized I've really got to reach out to my whole network, so I sent a mass email out to everybody I could think of saying, would you join my Facebook? Well, now I have over um, 1,000 Facebook names, and that's you know, good for me. It's not as good as a lot of other people. But it's good enough that I can send a message out on behalf of Toolshed and reach all those people. And they're all interested, because I'm writing something that's interesting. And I do the same thing with Twitter. We have a company Twitter, and we have a, uh, I have my personal Twitter. And in our company Twitter, we put um, media that's available. So all of these things are about creating an online destination for your brand, for the stuff that you are trying to get people to focus on. I, people come here, they go to our Toolshed Twitter because they know they're going to get things. Um, so I guess it comes back to that again. Um, I didn't really launch into a couple of the um, online opportunities. We have, we have about 10 minutes 10 left. Minutes? Yep. So would you rather talk about that or would you rather talk about sort of the future? I, I will. Uh, I would, boy, I'd love to talk about the future. Like talk about the future? Okay. Yeah. Tell me what's going to happen. All right. <laughs> I'm going to try. So, 
Uh, I'll tell you by way of, of looking at what's, hap what's happened in the past. Companies like, there, there are four companies that I'm, I'm involved with um, directly. TuneCore is one, I'm sure you've all heard of TuneCore. That's a company that, folks, that provides uh, services to artists um, and allows them to sell their music direct. Show of hands, who has a TuneCore account? Anybody have one? One. Great, good, so you know that you get your music on iTunes. I can't see anybody else, yeah, sorry. But I, I can see you. you, you get your music on iTunes through that and, and some of the other digital services, right? So, and you do it without having to pay a percentage of your revenue. That's a great deal. Fantastic deal, actually, if you're in a band. Yep. Um, you, you don't need to be probably um, if you make music and you don't If you make music and you don't know what TuneCore is, please find out. TuneCore uh, will we'll get, you know, for a small fee, uh, what is it, for an album, 35 bucks? Uh, no, even less. 10 I think bucks? It's like 25 or $20. For a small fee, they'll, they'll put your record uh, on iTunes, and yeah. you can refer people to uh, an iTunes And you'll get paid. Device. All the money from iTunes will come into your account. You can take it out anytime you want via P PayPal. So that's a great example yep. of, a, of, a, of a company that's sort of responding to, it, to a need. Um, you know, they're, they're, I'm not going to talk about these other ones. They're a little more arcane. But go where, go where, where other people don't want to go. Um, you know, I, I looked at a, a, a publishing company. Publishing's a little bit complicated, but you know, you've got four years in school now. Oh, yeah. uh, you got public. the opportunity to look into it a lot more. There was no music industry studies program when when I went to school, and uh, you know, so I had to fit this all in after after school. You could do this during school, um, which is amazing. The future, I, I think, you have to be really careful not to um, not to think in one dimension. And here's what I mean by that: when you um, Look at something like P2P, file sharing. So file sharing um, is variously looked on, depend depending on who's looking at it, is either you know, the threat that's going to sink the music industry, or on the other end, um, the tool that's going to save the music industry. Um, and depending on where you fall in that, that, that chain, uh, you have one definition or other, or, or some shade of gray of that. But you know. I heard just the other day that they're already looking at um, at three-dimensional P2P. So three-dimensional P2P is modeling, um, people sharing schematics that can be electronically laid, like so, car wow, parts. I don't, I don't know what any of that means. Car parts. <clears throat> you can send through a a uh, a file that contains the instructions to a digital lathe to make a car part. Oh, I see. So the next thing that's going to be shared, I would guess, on the internet is going to be things like car parts. Mm. And that's going to hurt somebody else's industry. <laughs> I, I mean, I, you think it's a problem right now for the music industry. Well, what, what if you didn't have to buy your parts at Ford right. or wherever it is? Okay, so you know, just, just one example of how you have to always be sort of thinking about, well, what's the next phase of this thing, and, and uh, is it going to stop here? Um, there's a, been a lot of talk about trying to license ISPs, internet service providers. Music labels in particular mm -hmm. are, are keen um, to look at this. So in that case, what would happen? Can you describe how, how that sure. would work? If, if, you have, if you own songs. If you own songs, the idea would be that, oh, well, let me put it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Generally, the idea would be if, if, uh, if you do anything with the music over your ISP, you share it, with whether or not it's it's using a file share client or or however you're sharing it, I am whatever it is, it would track your um, your usage and it would charge everybody um, like a some fee, five dollar fee or whatever the amount is. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of discussion about that because it starts right at the source, you know, the, the ISP being the source. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I think it's actually going to happen or not because it's a little big brother. Yeah, sorry, I'm dying. Are we live? No. Everybody still hear me? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's this thing called uh, politics. <coughs> Here, why don't you take this? I, I'm I'm the loud guy. I'm not talking. Okay. Yeah, that's probably why I wore it out. Shut up. Okay.
and, and politics is really how things get done in the music business. Um, and not just politics of the music business, but actual politics in Washington, in, Wa in Washington DC. Um, yes? Can you hear the mic? I can say, <laughs> I don't know what. But, uh, but anyway, we'll do politics in just a minute. I just wanted to uh, say to start to wrap up. John McHugh was talking about the power of music in the city. Don't be, don't be afraid of the political side of music is what I'm getting at. Because things like ISP, uh, charging ISPs um, levies is going to be decided in the political arena. arena. And there are plenty of advo advocacy organizations. Future of Music is one that's focused specifically at artists. Get yourself involved with that. Every year, they, I have to say one more thing. They, every year they put out, um, uh, they have a certain number of comp memberships for people that are interested. So go there and express your interest. Futureofmusic.org, yeah, is, is the name of it. Um, Future of Music uh, has a uh, political component to it. Uh, one of the questions that we're getting is, is there a parallel between the Future of Music campaign and the Trump campaign? And uh, the Future of Music campaign is in D.C. and it's run by uh, it's, uh, a pretty great big uh, association of little networks that I know that um, that maybe started with Trump. So, uh, so um, Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. I can hear them. Yeah. I can hear them. I didn't know who was supposed to stop at six or eight.